All right. Octum Cthulhu with spot hidden. So, starting with the characters, we have Anushka Dragomir, Russian. He was Red Army. And uh, actually, let me pull up some of my information here. She was Red Army, had a bit of a disagreement with her superiors. Uh, she stands at approximately 5 foot 9 inches, brown hair, brown eyes, a scar across the face. She's a crack shot, a marksman. Uh, she uh, is labeled a bit of a deserter. Um, again, disagreement with the Red Army, with her superiors. And a little bit after that, found herself working with KP, who we're about to get here and uh, get to here in a second. Um, Eric O'Connor, U.S. military, five foot ten, brown eyes, uncertain hair color. There always seems to be oil mixed into it. Uh, should probably bathe a little bit more, but that's okay because he is a bit of a genius. He's also known as Pinky. He lost his pinky in a mechanical repair accident. Very original. Um, but when it comes to any mechanical or technical subject, he is able to understand super complex systems very quickly. Uh, and of course, this was shown off both possibly in service as well as uh, work back home in Jersey. And whether or not he knows it, he's a bit of a strategic mastermind. Um, he's able to use that knowledge he has to prepare for defense, prepare for offense, um, set up whatever resources he might have, typically explosives, um, for the sake of uh, his team there. And Stone Hayes, of course. He's a diehard Texan soldier, standing at about six foot four inches, brown hair and blue eyes, and displays exceptional leadership and courage. Uh, well, if you'd call it that, a general's dream soldier. To be honest with you, uh, he refuses to back down from those engagements. And honestly, if you took the time to speak with him, you'd find that charismatic Texas charm as well. Uh, so this is the team we saw the Knights of Ten Dragon uh, put together here, and I'm gonna look off to the. Uh, side here as I reference my notes as well. So who are the Knights of Pendragon, otherwise known as KP? The Knights of Pendragon are, quite frankly, a very standard run-of-the-mill organization, undermining it, really any world government or military uh, to get their job done, which their job associates themselves with the people in it, associate themselves with those who know about uh, just about, <laughs> hey London, uh, just about anything uh, supernatural, paranormal, especially in a bit of a Cthulhu world. Uh, Captain Wesley Pendragon, now he's one of the overseers of this organization, if not the uh, more or less leader. Uh, he did put in a search for four elite soldiers there and came up with the three, Stone Hayes, Eric Pinky O'Connor, and Nushka Dragomir. And from there, that's where their adventure begins. So. If you don't mind, I'm going to break into a tr more traditional uh, recap style here. <clears throat> this just fell on my hand. Thank you, Vault Boy. All right. Mission one. So they get us all together, right? They put bags over our head, and they're like, ooh, and we're like, take the bag off our head. And then finally they do, and Stone's like, ah. And he gets all angry. And Anushka's like, why am I here? Hello, Initiative Order. It's good to see you. So we're all like, why'd you put the bag on our head? And some dude with a kilt is like, hey, my name's Pendragon, and you're going to work for me. And we're like, we don't have a choice. So then he sticks us in a plane and kicks us out. Well, maybe not him, but someone he got to kick us out because he pays everyone. He's probably got a lot of money. Uh, he might be the king of England. That's, an, uh, that's later on in the story. Uh, so... We fall out of this plane with a parachute. Yeah, yeah, that's what he starts with. My name's Ben Dragon. Uh, so we fall out of this plane with parachutes. First time ever doing it, by the way. Uh, and land in, well, trees in the German countryside. Because why not just throw us right into it? It's 1939, by the way. I think the war is like just starting. It might be 1938. I don't remember. Uh, yeah. And the <laughs> name of every spot in the campaign. Uh, my name's Ben Dragon. All right, so we fall into Germany. We don't know what's going on. Actually, we do know what's going on. You don't, because that's why you're tuning in now. Uh, so we're going to Hammerstein Castle, not as tourists, but as soldiers, as secret, super secret soldiers, but not in disguise, because it's hard to hide a six foot four Texan in a German disguise. 
Anyway, we sneak up. Actually, we were in disguise. That reminds me. We sneak into the first village. We go into a tavern. Guess who we meet? Another super secret agent. You couldn't guess. It's James Bond. Except the World War II James Bond, which could be the same one. But apparently he was a real guy. Anyway, he's like, hey, what's going on? Or, or uh, what's the Sean Connery? Uh, I can't do a Sean Connery impression, so I'll just make something up. Uh, hello, KP soldiers. Yeah, there we go. Perfect, right? I'm going to go take this airfield. You guys go to the castle. Because remember, your mission is to destroy some prototype tanks and kill the field marshal. Pretty brutal, right? Well, that's war. Uh, so we go, we look up at the castle, lightning strikes. It's crazy. But we get on a lift, like the ski lifts. But we're not going skiing unless it involves skiing down on dead German bodies. Dead Nazi bodies, I should say. So we get up to the castle, Castle Hammerstein. Everyone's like, whoa. And we look at the doors, and they're big and brassy and bold. Uh, and we sneak in, right? And we're all super stealthy. And we go to the office of the field marshal, and we sneak in. And he's like, ah! And he twists his mustache and tries to shoot us. But he doesn't get a chance. Actually, I think he does get a chance because Anushka took a bullet. Crazy stuff. And then Stone sinks a 12-gauge buckshot shell into him, and he flies out the window. And you hear him like, ah! Whatever. And then we were like, all right, he's dead, right? So then we go down the big old elevator that's in the castle. Uh, I, it's hard to explain. How do you explain it better? But there's a, apparently a massive elevator. We go down into a super secret underground cache and we find the tanks. And even though Pinky might be this genius, I want to go ahead and scratch that because we did not measure the amount of explosives that were down there. So we go up and we come back down. Uh, when we went up the first time, we found out that, well, you guessed it, the uh, field marshal isn't actually dead. Oh, no. Uh, so, yeah, he's just standing there with a big old hole in his chest. And he's like, hey, check this out. And he, like, puts his hand through, like, a magic trick. It was pretty lame. Anyway, uh, we're down in this cache. And we're like, you know what? Let's pour some gasoline. Light the bitch up. We're get out of here. I mean, hour, hour's time. Did a whole mission that quickly. And that's what makes us the best of the best. So we light it. We toss the match down. It lights that gasoline. It connects to the explosives. But nothing happens because we're going up in the elevator, right? And this is all... Keep in mind, for those just tuning in, episode one, we get back up to the top of the elevator, back at the top of the castle, uh, in a tank, by the way. We stole one for legal purposes. And then the field marshal's standing there with, like, two battalions of Nazis right behind him. And we're like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And then it turns out that uh, because we didn't measure the explosives, the entire mountain then explodes with the castle on top. So technically, we achieved our objective, um, but we also just turned a uh, prototype tank into, well, a P-45 Mustang. And now we're soaring through the sky. Uh, we land next to a body of water, but because we're pulp heroes, we survive, right? Because we're beefy. Uh, we get out of the tank. Tank's fucked, right? Pinky's like, let me toss a grenade. He does that. Uh, blows the remaining tank up. Remember, the entire mountain at this point is more or less gone. Uh, however, Stone looks up, because, I don't know, maybe he was just like, oh, man, thank God. Well, not thank God, because now there is a vampire in the shape of the Field Marshal Von Kruger flying over top of us. Remember, Field Marshal Von Kruger is a Nazi as well. We were supposed to kill him. We thought we did. Blue hole in his chest. It's gone now. It's complicated. We get back to the airfield. We sprint to the airfield, right? We're taken off. We get there. Uh, James Bond is now in a plane. James Bond is also here, uh, if you weren't aware. He has taken the airfield. He has a plane waiting on us. And who lands in front of us? The vampire. Von Kruger's like, ah, ah, ah. And so we start fighting him, right? Now this is where it gets complicated. This is the second episode in. Stone almost dies, right? Can't help it. That's just how the battle, that's how the dice gods chose it to be. Uh, so this man has sunken his teeth into Stone's throat after a good, I don't know, what, 20, 30 minutes of combat. The plane's already fired up. James Bond is like, screw that guy. Uh, and lo and behold, Anushka comes to the rescue of Stone Haze and fires that last bullet. And the crack rings out as the sunlight reaches over the top. The signal, I believe, in the morning. I forget what time of day it was. And it takes the head off that vampire, decapitated. But not before that shot. Splitting the neck of that vampire 
the teeth had already sunken into stone. And now he's got something to deal with. Hello, my Travis. I'm going to take a second here. Pause and thank you uh, for your first time chat here in Twitch. We appreciate you uh, tuning in. Now, we end the second episode with the knowledge that Stone has now turned into a vampire. Remember, we got three characters, Nushka, Eric, Pinku, Connor, Stone, Hayes, World War II. That was 1939, 1938, somewhere in there. But we fast forward to 19... 19- 40 or 41, one of those two. I don't know, man. It's, it's like, it's just all one time frame. Anyway, so we fast forward. Stone has now grown his hair out a little bit more because it turned a nice uh, light gray from the brown it was before. His blue eyes are now much brighter blue. They seem to pierce a little bit more. They haven't changed shape or design or uh, the appearance, but they're still that bright blue. Uh, of course, he might have a couple of canines that have descended down a little bit more, but he still retained that same stone charm, and that's exactly who he is. Uh, continued to be, despite a little bit of trouble with uh, the scent of blood, the standard vampire thing. That's how it goes. He doesn't sparkle in the sun, which is good, but now he's got something to contend with. Uh, in the meantime, Anushka and Pinky are there. Uh, also, as we have all agreed to join in with Pendragon's crusade here, we attempted to perhaps halt Germany's uh, ascent to starting that war, uh, prevent them uh, from being as ready as they were, and it appears we didn't change much. But we find out it was almost a bit of a test mission, as Pendragon forgot to tell us that there was going to be a vampire, uh, which obviously has changed some stuff now. But A year or two later, we'll say one, in 1940, Captain Pendragon sends us to Africa, around Cairo to be exact. That's actually episode five and six. I went a little bit too far in my notes. Now we're actually going to double back. That was made on purpose. We're actually going to Norway. Actually, right off the shores, the seas of Norway. Not that anyone would know, because it is done rather stealthily in a U-boat, a submarine, a stolen one. Um, there seems to be an underground uh, German uh, construction, a German station underneath the water level, underneath the sea level, uh, built on some kind of structure. But the reason we're going there is due to a U-boat, a submarine, uh, being lost to something. They can't identify what, but the captain piloting our submarine, our U-boat, is petrified of returning there. But we're like, ah, it's going to be fine. So we hop in this underground tube, basically, underwater tube, and we head to Norway, right? And so we get there, and we're like, oh, man, where are the Germans? Because there were not. All the Nazis were gone, which is technically a good thing. No one wants Nazis around. Uh, But we see, like, three towers, right? They're underwater towers. And we're like, let's go hit that one real quick. And as we're going there, we check out these other things, and there's, like, structures underwater. Like, someone lived here at one point, which is crazy. Because we're human, we're not designed to live underwater, right? But whatever, we go into this tower, there's no one in it. It's, I don't know, you ever play some Nautica? It's like, you know, sitting on some supports or something. I don't know how Putty had it pictured in his head. But I know I had it pictured in my head, because theater of the mind, that's how tabletop works. We get into the station. Long story short, we find some stuff. Something about Atlantis? The land, lost land of Atlantis? Well, if you haven't already connected the dots, which I have because I've already played it and I was there, we are now at Atlantis, or at least what's left of it, right? Uh, So we're sitting in this tower. End of the third episode, we hear a roar. There's a big shadow outside that Anushka sees. Anushka sees. There we go. And I would do a Russian accent, but I can't, like Carly can, which she actually uh, does very, very well. Uh, So tune in to the uh, final episode there to catch that possibly. Uh, well, we'll get there when, we'll bring that bridge when we get to it. So, we're underwater. We've just heard that roar, that big shadow. Like another submarine, but more mobile and more not a submarine. And we're like, we got to get out of here. So we run, we dive back out. Remember, we're in prototype suits. I haven't mentioned that yet, but remember it. So we're in prototype dive suits, right? We only have a certain amount of air in these tanks, but that's okay because Remember, we're supposed to just go back to the U-boat. No big deal, right? So we start investigating. 
after seeing that shadow. Now, the order of how it happened is the tricky part, but I know we go down into one of these caverns, these sea caverns. Not really a cavern. It's now been opened up, more or less, and we're able to descend down into a partially covered, well, cemetery. We see a whole bunch of gravestones uh, built up because it's not exactly digging down into the seawater, sea dirt, sea sand. Uh, it is taking its own construction. So all of these graves are constructed uh, with stone of some kind. Uh, but there's one big one right in the middle. So what does Nushka do? Well, Nushka goes right to the one that looks most important. Which, honestly, if you're going to play tabletop, always go to the big, most important looking one. That's going to be where the fun stuff is, no matter if it's bad for you. Anushka whips open that top. Stone is like, I'm getting out of here. So he takes off, and Pinky's like, I guess I'm going with Stone. So we start to leave, and then Anushka pulls out a stick, a three-pronged stick. And if you haven't already pieced it together, that stick is a trident. That trident is the trident of Atlantis. It's a power relic. More on that later. And Anushka's like, I don't know what to do with this. And I think they failed a power roll. Anushka did. And so there was nothing that was felt. And she was like, this is probably important. So she takes it back with her, right? Uh, but in the meantime, now there's a Kraken. Don't know where that came from, but there's a Kraken. Uh, Anushka books it back to the safe U-boat. Uh, they start to fire at it. So they're launching bombs at this son of a bitch. Uh, some of them help. I'm going to lie. But what's more important is Stone goes down to the station that they were once in that has now crashed because the thing attacked it. And he grabs a torpedo of one of the U-boats that were supposed to be stationed there and then throws it because we're pulp, baby. That's how it goes. Uh, he throws it at this thing, does some damage. It is some pretty cool stuff. However, we're swimming to the other parts of this, these ruins, right? Whatever you want to call them. I don't know. The old Atlantis. Whatever it is. Old town. Anushka's already back in the U-boat. The captain of the U-boat, forgot his name, is like, what are you doing here? We're, we got to get out of here. And Anushka convinces them to stick around. Because remember, we're both out there. At some point in all this, Pinky has hauled ass to another station. And instead of acting quickly, has decided to see if he can find some tar. You heard me right. Your ears are doing just fine. T-A-R. Tar. Because now he wants to, for some reason, make some sort of improvised underwater explosive. So there was the solid, let's just say, 15-20 minutes of just him describing what he needs. And then Hudson trying to debate whether or not there is tar in a German Nazi military base underwater off the coast of Norway. There wasn't. Spoiler alert. So now Eric's swimming back, right? Anushka tells the captain to stay put and then books it out, back out of this U-boat, out of what is sort of safety, more or less, and then gets the trident to Stone Haze. Why? Who knows? But it was a good call. You want to know why? Because he took that trident and he swam away. It's, it's, it's complicated. He swims away. He swims towards what looks like a coliseum, which... Upon appearance, upon appearance, excuse me, upon examination, he sees a very large statue of what looks like a king. He's got a crown. He's got the long, flowy hair. It's like the dude from, uh, uh, what is it, Finding Nemo? What's the one with the, the mermaid? Uh, My little, mer or little Mermaid? No, I don't know. It's the Disney one, right? Anyway, the long, flowy hair. He's got the trident in his hand, and Stone feels validated in his masculinity now seeing this barrel-chested statue, and then he looks down and sees a massive hole in where the floor of this Colosseum would be. It's not like taking the floor off and seeing the tunnels underneath at the Roman Colosseum. No, this is just a hole. And he looks at the Kraken and he realizes that it's the same size as the Kraken, if not bigger. This was his cage. It doesn't matter now, though. Now Stone is putting two and two together. He starts to point it at this Kraken. He starts to feel the power in his hand. He fails a couple times. But as soon as that Kraken now makes a move at the U-boat, turns to make a move at Stone, probably to just eat him in one go, because that's all it would take, Stone is able to achieve that power roll. And that power roll connected the mind of this six foot four Texas vampire with that rod stick, that trident, that underwater stick. And he points it, and it connects with the mind of that beast. 
and it comes to a stop right in front of him. And the water is still, and that roaring, that deep roar, like a reaper leviathan roar, stops. And Eric is, I believe, still panicking to get back to the U-boat. And Stone comes up gently to this kraken of Atlantis and places its hand right on its head, right between a very large gap between the eyes, and then saddles up on it. Because apparently we call that courage. And then pats it a little bit as if he's at a fucking rodeo. And then ascends to the top along with that U-boat, which every individual looking through that, uh, what do you call it, periscope, is now bloody confused. But both ascend to the top. Some come out onto the top of the U-boat. And Stone is ecstatic because he has just tamed, he has just broken a kraken. A full-sized just leviathan beast. And he is apparently so happy, he just rides it all the way back to Europe. But that doesn't matter. They, they figured it all out. And now they have a power relic. Again, more on that later. After playing around with his new friend, Stone, I mean, uh, there's been a little while. And now that we've gone underwater, we're going to the antithesis of a very uh, wet place, like under the, under the ocean. We're now going to Cairo. Egypt, or at least near it. We parachute in under the cover of night. We got this down. Also, there's no trees, thank God. Uh, much like there was in Germany in the first episode of the Castle Amberstein. So keep in mind, Castle Amberstein took out a field marshal, took out some prototype tanks. Pause. Stone's a vampire now. Three and four. We're now on shores of Norway, underwater. Took out some, well, actually we didn't. The Kraken took out some German Nazi stations near Atlantis while they were searching for the power relic. And then took out the Kraken, tamed it, actually. Keep in mind, that's where we're at now. Now five and six, we're in Africa. Well, Egypt, same continent. We're near Cairo, again, descending down in the cover of night. We're able to wait until our ground transportation arrives there. Associates. Associates? Associates of the Knights of Pendragon. They come over in their little jeep. Uh, friendly guys. Uh, very similar to characters in a popular adventure or series of movies. We get in their jeep. We take off in the morning to this German fortification. It is a base built on top of a mountainside. Actually, next to a valley. We're able to descend on the other side of the valley down into it. We see three different temples. And at this point, which temple do you think we should go in? I honestly don't know. And that was the entire conversation. Actually, as we're falling down ropes, uh, I believe it was Pinky, who then was like, whoops, and then landed on top of stone as they're descending down. Trying to be sneaky, obviously, but whatever. Uh, then there's a big conversation about the rope, about whether or not we should bring it. Uh, and then there's the combination of player talk and then character talk, doesn't matter. We keep moving. We get to the temple. Stone finds a book, and he's like, I'm going to touch it. And he does just that. He picks it up. And then there's apparently a breath in the air. Uh, doesn't matter. He sticks it in a bag. They take off. They're headed to the side of the other, sorry, the other side of the valley, right? Right under this German fortification. They start to ascend that. I forget how they get a rope up there. Doesn't matter. They find two Nazis at the top. Anushka sneaks up there, does some stealthy shit, man. It was wild. Kicks one off. Stone does something, grabs one of them. Pinky's still at the bottom, unable to climb. Stone's up there with Nushka. And there was a solid 20 or 30 minutes of deliberation on the next move. But we do know out of the three temples, there was one on the far right, a fourth one, that actually was more of a tunnel. We descend back down into the valley. We heart start heading towards that tunnel right as a huge desert storm came in. Keep in mind, right after that book was picked up, because Stone's an idiot. We get into that tunnel. Turns out to be more of a catacomb. Egyptian catacomb. Like a... What's the word? Doesn't matter. We get in. There's some dead guys, right? But not by guns. By scratch marks. Real big scratch marks. Imagine a cat, but like with a massive hand with swords just slashed right through. Pinky plays a trap with that dead body. Never actually happened. And now that I'm talking about it, I just realized nothing ever happened with that trap and it was a waste of a grenade doesn't matter. What if something did happen? A sandstorm is now outside. Can't escape. We proceed deeper. There's a big hole at the end of one of the tunnels. There's a few tunnels in here. 
And then, as they keep it described, a breath of life is released outside of that hold. So we, of course, proceed towards this breath of life. We ascend into a German compound out of this tunnel. Hello, Robo Pelican. It's good to see you, buddy. We send into this German warehouse. The reason we were here, let's back up a little bit. The reason we've come to Africa, come to Egypt, is because we are looking for a V2 rocket scientist who we are, uh, well, tasked with unaliving. We wanted to get rid of them, right? V2 rockets, not a good thing. And destroy the V2 rockets on site. That's what Captain Wesley Pendragon told us to do. So we're going to do it because that's how it, wars are won. So we ascend into this warehouse that we expect to have a V2 rocket. And there's a scientist, but he's not a V2 rocket scientist. Let's just say there's a few Nazis in it, right? But in the center, surrounded by what appears to be water on all sides, you have to jump down onto this lowered platform, is exactly that, a platform. There's an a, uh, altar on the far side. Next to that altar might have been a couple statues. But there is a scientist in a lab coat doing something. We take out these soldiers. Anushka takes out a few because Anushka's a little bit overpowered with how much of a crack shot Anushka is. But that's a good thing because marksmanship is a good thing in this setting. It is, I promise. Takes out a few of the Nazis. We all ascend to the top. Eventually, as you might have assumed already, but let me say it because I can't hear you through this Twitch stream, or through this YouTube video. There is a mummy, a pharaoh, that is come out of the catacomb? I don't know, man. It arrives somehow, right? So now there's this tall-ass mummy, wrapped, standard bandages, and it's like, Ugh, basically an Egyptian zombie, right? But it's got powers. I forget what powers, but it had powers. And it starts coming after us. But Stone's got this special fork. The Trident, right? From episodes three and four. Remember that we were in Norway, found the power relic. He's got this power relic. He's spinning it around like some, I don't know, what do you call it? Uh, what's the people that can do hand-to-hand -hand combat real well? Martial artists. That's the words I'm looking for. He's spinning that thing around. He's fighting this, this Egyptian zombie, this mummy, as it's, I don't know, saying like, or whatever mummies say, you know, the typical standard thing. Uh, Pinky is now reading a book. It's the same book that Stone threw to him. Pinky finds a page with power relics. Not useful to the situation, unfortunately. Uh, Anushka's up on a railing, taking pot shots at the mummy, almost killing Stone. But Anushka can't miss, so she's not killing Stone, which is a good thing, I promise. Stone finally gets one last jab with the power relic into this uh, weird mythological being. And we see that breath of life that uh, appeared with the grabbing of that book and with the catacomb entrance opening that breath of life now escapes out the side of a warehouse probably going to be still around but we've gotten rid of it for now pinky points out in this book this leather bound possibly human leather skin potentially that's unconfirmed he didn't say it i just like to say it for dramatic effect this book he points out the same power relic that stone is holding this trident of atlantis and he sees two other drawn pictures. He sees a sword and he sees a bow. We have a bow, a sword, and a trident. All drawn, sketched into this page. Just before they get to talk to that scientist, or just after, he says a few remarks regarding the Knights of Pendragon. Remember, the Knights of Pendragon are the super secret organization we work for. How does someone, how does the Nazi know about them? And before we could even ask or think about it, a wall crashes down. An armored truck, maybe with tracks on it, I don't know, crashes through one of the walls. We're surrounded by what appear to be Nazi soldiers, but they're wearing darker uniforms. They're a little bit more mysterious, a little bit more sketchy. Hence why we stopped, and also plot points, because at the end of the episode, we're surrounded by these new soldiers we've never seen before. And an ugly man, a bearded man, not me, comes down and makes some remark in an accent I can't duplicate. It was European. I want to say a little bit Irish, but I don't think that's what it is. Anyway, he comes down and he captures us with the help of his, all of these buddies of his, and we wake up in episode 7. <laughs> that's how it was elaborated to us. Anyway, 
Episode 7, we wake up in the desert. We're in the middle of the Egyptian desert, buried literally from neck down in sand. All that stands out is our heads that are, I believe are covered. Pinky is able to just finagle his way out of the sand, right? Like a snake, uh, which is a good thing in this case. He digs both of us out. Stone's freaking out because he's a vampire. He's like, Aah! and he has to get behind more stone. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, what is that, alliteration? I don't know. I don't know. How, I was a theater major. I don't understand anything, um, especially when it involves thinking. Um, what is it? Alliteration. Uh, uh, stone needs stone. That's, I don't know. Play on words? We'll leave it at that. Play on words is the easy get out answer. Anyway, he's taking cover from the sun because the sun's his biggest enemy right now. Pinky's Jeep sense tingles, right? We're at this weird, uh, the reason we found stones is because we're at this weird temple in the middle of the Saharan desert. Or at least that's what it seems like. Pinky's Jeep sense tingles. He goes to the front of this ruin and finds a perfectly preserved Jeep, a German Jeep, with a gun mounted on the back. Gasoline. Plenty of gasoline for it. Of course, it's already filled up. This Jeep is pristine. Just came off the lot. Brand new. Volkswagen, probably. I don't know when Volkswagen started. He tells us. We run over. Investigated the rest of the ruin. Didn't make any sense. Didn't line up with any of the other things we were looking at. Who left us here? Why is Stone Shirt? Can he find other clothes? He did. We get into this Jeep. Pinky's driving. Nushka's on the gun. Stone's in the passenger. He finds an MP40 in the back. Grabs it. They take off through the desert. Heading, I believe, north after they found a compass. They also left us with a compass. Doesn't make any sense. We take off, and suddenly, from behind, a team of mounted melee riders with ancient, ghostly sets of armor ascend from the sand, running on horses. Doesn't make any sense, I know. And you're about to find out why. They're chasing the Jeep. They're as fast as this Jeep in the sand, in the desert. We're booking it, but it doesn't matter because these horses are quick. So they're gaining on us, right? They're catching up. Anushka's back throwing the gun like, ah! It's not helping. She takes out a couple, but then the keeper rolls. And because the keeper uh, didn't really balance it that well, sorry, buddy, uh, just starts throwing horses at us, rolling to see how many would be attacking us. Uh, But keep in mind, that was after the end of each round. We get lucky the first two times, and then the next two rounds, we get four back-to-back, meaning there are now eight-plus horses attacking three people in a jeep. We keep going. We get lucky for some time. We're taking out some. Stone's able to shoot some. At one point, Pinky had to fix the jeep. That may have been before they attacked. It worked out all right. We keep going. There's a town in the far distance. We see a body of water, a river through this desert. A little bit of an oasis, maybe palm trees sticking up, a little bit of grass. But more importantly, that town. And we're gunning it for it. Anushka's head is removed from her body. After Pinky took a sword through his body. Our driver is down. Stone grabs the wheel. Anushka, her body falls. Head rolls off the jeep. We're in town at this point. Stone gets to the other side of town, near the body of water. At this point, lost the attention of any of those ghost, ghost uh, horse-riding soldiers. He finds a small fishing boat with a small motor on the back and takes off, taking the two body, bodies of his fallen comrades with him and is, takes off towards what, what he can only imagine to be the sea, away from all of the torment and suffering he just endured, just to find his buddy, the Kraken, pop up out of the water, out of the ocean, and swallow him whole. And then he wakes up, because we got hit with that trope. Thanks, putty. Uh, We wake up, turns out we're being tortured uh, with an experimental drug, possibly, by Sir Victor Gwaine, the very man, ugly man, who came from some place where he has an accent that I can't duplicate. Uh, And he injects us with another super secret serum, who knows, asking us uh, weird questions like, why did you m- mismatch your socks? Or um, why do you have little dime nipples? Stone doesn't matter. Anyway, we are then moved to episode eight. Still in Africa, not in a dream this time, mind you. This time, Sir Victor Gwaine has brought us to a table. He likes the skill that we possess. He likes our abilities. And with that, he asks us to join him. What are we supposed to do? It's either that or death, obviously, right? As it goes. 
he gets up and leaves the table because all bad guys need a reason to leave the table. It could be because they need the latrine or because the plot tells them to leave the table and they can sense it. He leaves. An artillery shell hits the roof of the building we're in. We break out of the restraints that we did not have because there were guards, and that's what made us keep sitting down. That's right, I think. Something like that. Pinky pushes through a door. He sees an ancient forge. Very old forge. Tools he's never seen before. Tools he might know, but are well out of practice. Stone goes into Gwen's office. Anushka looks into another room that I've forgotten. Stone steals some papers that I forgot he took until just now, and they probably would have helped us out a little bit if I had remembered them. Pinky doesn't register that this forge is very important and comes back out of that room. I think Anushka was in there at one point. Doesn't matter. We now book it out of there. We're in a German compound in Africa. It's built with that stucco material that is used down there, and I don't know what it is, but it's kind of cool, and I like it. Anyway, we now have to go from the center of this compound out without being tracked by any Germans. So the rest of this episode is a whole bunch of shooting as we blast our way out, taking out bad guys left and right, kicking them off towers. Uh, it turns out the reason that artillery shells struck is because our allies, those same people that hauled us to where we needed to be a few episodes back in near, well, near Cairo, uh, are now attacking this compound. Works out for us. And we managed to escape. Anushka singles, or I should say solos, a take. Uh, jumps on top, nearly dies, but that's aside from the point because she solos a tank and manages to take it all on her lonesome. We hop in and get the hell out. But that is after, I should note, that we found the helm of Alexander the Great, which, as a technical playable piece, boosts our armor by, I believe, two or three points. But we never wear it. We actually just returned it back to uh, KP headquarters and left it with them. But it was cool to find there in Africa. We then escape. We are taken care of, our wounds mended, food returned to us since it had been stolen for so long. And we regain our health as we are informed of what the next mission will be much later on. Excuse me. If there are any questions or uh, anything that you'd like me to elaborate on, definitely leave a comment in chat. Okay. Where are we at? Here we go. We fully regained our strength. It is now 1942, a year later. Captain Wesley Pendragon has agreed to go on missions with us, which he has off and on while we might return to uh, battles, maybe the battle in Africa, uh, to assist fellow soldiers or assist the war effort. But it is now 1942. Stone has been working on controlling his uh, urges as a vampire to uh, unleash that, uh, that beast. I believe there's commercial about that. That's aside from the point. Captain Wesley Pendragon cannot join us on this next one after promising he would after we all got captured. So it's a little bit of a kick in the pants, but that's aside from the point because we are now in Russia, right outside Stalingrad. We drop in yet again, possibly under the cover of night. It doesn't matter. It's very cloudy and very cold, extremely cold. It is a Russian winter near Stalingrad. Why anyone invaded Russia when it was cold? They're in the middle of, middle of winter. Yeah, just, why do they keep doing it? They keep doing it. We should have learned from the first guy. And then they kept doing it. Anyway, we drop into woods outside of, well, anywhere. The only other thing aside from trees is snow. And if it's not snow, it's ice over a body of water, which Pinky will then proceed to fall into. He falls into a, a pond, a lake that was covered with ice. Now Stone has to save his ass, and we save him, we run to the other side, the other trees, right? We get there, now we have to wait the night out. So I guess it's a little bit before nightfall. Pinky and Stone both then, at this point, have to strip down, obviously, because now their clothes are wet, and that's how that goes. I think they say not to take your clothes off 
No. If it's too cold, you have to take your clothes off. Let's say if you're like camping or doing something in Alaska, because if you get into a sleeping bag and you might sweat or perspire, that can really mess you up if you're wearing your clothes. I don't know. There's something about that that I don't have the information on. I just remember hearing offhand at some point. doesn't matter. We're sitting next to a fire. We're sitting around the fire. Nushka's on watch. We're sleeping. A truck comes up right outside the forest. We head that way. We are under the cover of trees and snow. We all line the edge of this forest. We then start shooting at this truck, the two people in it, or whatever it is we did. I don't know. But it gets away. One of the soldiers in it takes off. So we decide to go the opposite direction. We come across a small hut in the middle of this battleground. Dead bodies everywhere. Mutilated bodies everywhere. Frozen over in this cold. But we get to this small cabin. We hear a child's cry from in, inside. Turns out that that small child, after speaking with him, is Anna, Anastasia of Russia. The niece of, who was it? Rasputin. Long story short, Anna is a vampire. Or, to be more specific, I don't know how to say it. They're in The Witcher. Wordlac? Wordlac? I don't I don't know, man. Anyway, vampire. She's got the claws, she's got the teeth, the whole shebang, right? Anna takes us back to a cave. Don't worry, she likes us. We're cool. We're I mean, we we really got the point across that we're all cool, right? She just doesn't like the whole communist thing or whatever it was. I don't know. Stone doesn't know. We get back to her cave. Turns out Rasputin's skeleton is mounted up on her wall. Cool. I mean, that's that's bold. You want to be original with interior design, and she is. You got to give her credit. We take the other route out of this cave. We ascend near an ammo dump, near a blown up, what is it, church? The tower is still there, but we know what's next to an ammo dump. Anushka doing the sniper thing, finds the high ground, jumps up into that tower, finds the top, and who would have guessed? It's Reznov. Exactly who you're thinking. Yep. If you played Call of Duty, it's Reznov. And he's like, oh, hello, or whatever it is. I don't know. Dimitri, or whatever it is he says. It's cool shit. Can't lie. Reznov's, Rez, Rev, Reznov? Revnov's? Anyway, he's up there with Anushka now. They get to know each other, they're a cup of tea or something like that. Wow, the two vampires and Pinky now start heading for an ammo dump. Pinky has a flamethrower. Where did he find it? Don't remember. But Pinky's got a flamethrower. The two vampires proceed into this cloud-covered land of Russia that is being used as an ammo dump. We take out a few soldiers. Stone uses a tool, a weapon, a repeating crossbow that Pinky had made. Spoiler, it was something that I want to do because I want to make cool weapons that were experimental and that was the only one I ever really did because at the end of the day, I wanted to just use a good shotgun. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Anyway, they eventually turn into their new form. They spot the man himself, the ugly man, Victor Gwaine. Sir Victor Gwaine, but he's an asshole, so he doesn't get the sir with the trident. He gets scared because we're doing too well. He throws the trident at an ammo dump fuel canister. The big old fuel drum tank blows it up and escapes. And then summons the trident back as if it was like Majolnir or like Thor's hammer. And so didn't know that could happen. Stone didn't know. Whatever. Anyway, he runs off because Plot saved his ass. We've blown up the ammo dump. But that doesn't matter at this point because Rev, Reznov, Reznov, that's the one. Uh, Mason, the numbers, what do they mean? Reznov has now descended that tower from where he was with Anushka. Anushka is like, where the hell did that old man go? He's gone like the wind. Anna is with us. We descend down into a sewer, more or less, because at this point we are near and what is at least close enough to a street to be considered for a sewer, but we are now in one. And we start heading towards what we can only imagine is the direction towards Stalingrad. Anushka and Pinky are stuck up top. Anushka and Pinky, speaking of, proceed that same way and spot. A Nazi soldier, maybe a Russian soldier, stumbling towards them. They can't tell, but their shoulders are dropped, they're bowed, the head is off to the side, and they look bloody. 
And as they get closer, it's exactly what you think it is. We got Nazi zombies. Why couldn't we have Nazi zombies in this 20-episode campaign? Because we should have, and we did. Thank you, Hudson. So we get Nazi zombies. We're down in the sewer. Finally, they find a hatch to join us down in the sewer later on because the other one was covered. They jump down. Now it's Reznov, Anushka, Pinky, Stone, and Anna, Anastasia of Russia, who is a vampire, a word you like, or whatever, however you say it. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We're all down in the sewer. These zombies are stumbling at us. Stone then delivers a shotgun blast that takes out three. Keep in mind, this is tabletop ruling. How do you take out three enemies with one move? I'll tell you how. It's because our keeper's cool, and uh, you're able to affect other targets with one shot. And when one shotgun blast from five feet away deals, I don't know what it was, 42 damage? Well, it worked out. Let's just say that. I don't remember what the damage was. It was wild. And these things are basically made of paper mache and, like, spit. So they fell apart. Anyway, we're running through these sewers. Something might have happened important that I don't remember. But Reznov is now gone. How? Don't remember. I think he actually waited until we found the other side of the sewer. Because this was more or less a dungeon crawl. We come up in Stalingrad and he is just gone. Like Hannibal Lecter at the end of Silence of the Lambs just disappears into the crowd of Russian soldiers tending to the wounded. Because we have arrived in a very... Uh, uh, secure location in Stalingrad. And that's the episode, end of episode 9, 10, and 11. Anna, the vampire, Anastasia of Russia, stays with uh, Captain Pendragon and the Knights of Pendragon at HQ. Possibly, I don't know, experiencing childhood or turning other kids into vampires, whatever it is vampire children do. Uh, keep in mind, she also wasn't a child. She's actually like 30-something years old. Just, I don't know. Vampirism, vampirism is weird. Uh, anyway. I would ref refill my drink, but this train has no brakes. Moving on. This is where my notes... This. I, I, I combine like these and this into one word. This is where my notes get a little bit more sparse. So a lot of this is going to be coming from ye old memory. Here we go. It is now 1942. I believe it was 1942 before. It is possibly the same year, if not 1943. It's somewhere in there. It's all one time chunk. We're now in Italy. One of my favorite places. I've never been, but I can't wait to go. Possibly in the future. But right now it's 1942, and I'm a fictional character. Known as Stone Hayes. Me, personally. Of course, Anushka, played by Carly Sims. And Eric Pinky O'Connor, played by Trevor Turner, are there with me. And our game master, Hudson Hubbard, is leading the way for us. To break it all down, before we get into Rome, Italy, let's catch up on where we're at. Episodes 1 and 2. Germany. Castle Hammerstein. Taking out the Field Marshal, von Kruger, taking out prototype tanks to slow down the German effort to eventually start a war. Didn't work. Stone becomes a vampire. Was sort of an expendable mission to see how we do. We did really well. Barely. Sir Captain Pendragon. Not Sir Captain Pendragon. King Captain Pendragon. Wesley Pendragon. The leader of Knights of Pendragon. I've said Pendragon so many times. Has now decided to keep working with us as we didn't die, which is a really good sign. So, episodes 3 and 4, we're at the shores of Norway. We find the power relic, the trident. I should also note that was stolen later on. We find that trident. Fight a kraken. Tame the kraken. Kraken is now on the side of ye old Stone Haze, who's also a vampire. Keep in mind, episodes 5 and 6. We are now, putting in my notes, in Cairo, Egypt. <laughs> we go to Cairo to destroy V-2 rockets and eliminate a V-2 rocket scientist. Instead of a V-2 rocket scientist, he's just a normal scientist, and there are no V-2 rockets. Instead, there's a big old mummy that came out of a catacomb and was killing people and tried to kill us. But we got it because we had a special power relic. It was a special underwater Atlantis Fork. And who stole it? An ugly guy named Sir Victor Gwain, who doesn't like the Knights of Pendragon, because, I don't know, we don't accept money like mercenaries like he is? I don't know what the reasoning was. Whatever. That was 5 and 6, Hyrule Egypt. Get kidnapped. Episode 7, we're in a dream state. 
All of us die except for Stone, who then dies by the Kraken. We wake up to find that all three of us were being tortured by Victor Gwaine and his, uh, I don't know, bad guy friends. Episode 8. We then break out because as the standard bad guy maneuver tries to, I don't know, persuade us to fight for him because money, which I guess, I mean, would work for some people, but I don't understand interrogation techniques because I've never learned, so it's not important. Anyway, tries to sway us, leaves. We are able to escape and find the helm of Alexander the Great. Episodes 9, 10, and 11, we are in Stalingrad, Russia. We fight Nazi zombies in the sewers. We find Anastasia of Russia, who is actually a vampire. We find Reznov, who was there. Anyway, we then are now in Rome, Italy. What's our mission? Hard to say. Pendragon's with us, though. He takes out a soldier, a Nazi soldier, on a road after we had arrived by boat. I snuck up the side of a hill. They were both taking piss. They were taking a piss for quite some time because we were able to work out a plan the entire time they were pissing. Anyway, we take them out, take a jeep into town. This town has a bar. Stone speaks a little bit of Italian. Whatever Stone has learned over the two semesters of Italian he had at Auburn University, War Eagle. They then get into a bar fight with Nazis. Because there's Nazis everywhere. It's, it's Italy. It's in 1942. They've taken over, right? 1943. I'm not sure. Anyway, we're fighting. Uh, Stone turns into a vampire. Big fucking surprise. Uh, we chase one out the window. The episode ends. We come back. And we actually go a little bit deeper into town. And then on the outskirts, we finagle the jeep between walls. When we come across an entrance, a secret entrance, mind you, to catacomb underneath Rome. This catacomb or, or dungeon, whatever you'd like to call it, is a little bit grimy at first. It essentially turns into a very pristine, a very clean, well-kept place. There's a room with a very large table with a large map on it. That stone then folds up and steel. That's torch lit. We descend deeper. We split up. Because that's a good idea. Stone and Pendragon? Or Stone and Pendragon. I take off as a team. Anushka and Pinky take off on their own. Pinky finds a fucking bow. A bow and arrow. Which makes sense, I guess. But it's not just any bow and arrow. It is Attila's bow. I think Attila the Hun, I want to say. I don't know. I, I don't know my history like like Trevor or Huddy, doesn't matter. He finds bow and arrow. He's like, oh, dope. Uh, and then is apparently just able to sense that it will hit anything. We didn't really RP that he figures out that it can't miss. But that's the thing. We get to another room where we find Brutus. The Brutus who betrayed Caesar is just chilling in this just room, this suspended room. As in, like, the, you fall over the wall, you just keep falling. There's nothing down there except for, like, I don't know, death? Anyway, Brutus is all maniacal and ghostly. Turns out he was actually pinned to this weird circle, a summoning circle. The same, the same Brutus that killed Caesar. Anyway, don't know what they were doing trying to summon him. Anyway, Brutus, the betrayer, uh, then starts to fight us, and Stone gets the smart fucking idea to go into his little contained circle with him, because clearly he couldn't escape from the circle. Doesn't matter. Stone jumps in and immediately gets knocked on his ass, because he he just treaded into enemy territory. Anyway, we eventually take him out. I think someone stabs a book. It's hard to recall. The only thing that was doing damage to him was a bow. Keep in mind, we have lost the trident and has gone to the ugly dude, Victor Quayne. We eventually take out Brutus, obviously, because we're winners. We then leave Rome, Italy. It is 1944. We have done missions in between this, not as players, but as characters. They have uh, taken off to help with battles or accomplish small side tasks uh, for the sake of the Knights of Dragon. It is 1944, June, after D-Day. Our team. Anushka, 
Pinky, Stone Hayes, have taken off with the Rangers to help clear Germans from behind the front lines. Not storming the beaches. I believe it was canon that they did assist in storming the beaches. It is now a day after, and we are hanging out next to a small village in a medic camp. We are helping uh, the wounded, American wounded, the uh, possibly any other uh, local countrymen and women, uh, helping them if they're injured. We're, it's a medic camp. We're helping anyone who's injured, right? Uh, Stone inspires a young radio operator or something. I don't know. Pinky's working on a jeep. We go into town. Turns out one of the American soldiers is having a grand old time with, uh, with, with a, a, a fine young woman, which is nice uh, if everyone was in agreement and anything. Whatever. Anyway, there's a tank stuck in the mud here in this small town. And then on the side of this tank, it said Fury. As in the tank's name was Fury. Don't know where he got that inspiration. Cool name. We keep investigating this small town. It is very Cthulhu-esque at this point. We don't know what's going on. We were supposed to just help the troops here at this medic camp. Uh, and we find bodies diced up. Like, I don't know. Just diced up, man. They're ripped to shreds by something that looks sharp. Probably swords or whatever it was. Doesn't matter because we eventually find out what did it. Uh, it's a Ditoten. Which is... To summarize, an armored zombie with just swords for hands. They have an armored head. It's actually a very cool character design by uh, the brilliant minds over at Modifius. Uh, but the head is armored with this cage. You can hear almost uh, uh, pained uh, sounds coming from within. The rest is a uniform. But the hands, the fingers have been replaced with very sharp edged blades, obviously. We fight it in this clearing in the woods, uh, finding strategies, finding ways other than shooting it, because unfortunately just shooting it wasn't working. Someone eventually got his hands on that armored helmet and is able to rip it off with his vampiric strength, giving Anushka a very clear shot to it, a clear shot to this gumless, eyelidless zombie thing looking at it with those piercing eyes like the end of Resident Evil 2. Whichever one had Nemesis, the movie. It's not a good movie, but it's Resident Evil, so I, I don't know. It was all right. Anyway, we take out the Ditoten. We get back to town. Everything is now well and good because we have saved the town from an abomination, more or less. Episode 15 and 16. We find out that Pendragon has been kidnapped by Sir Victor Gwain. How? Who knows? Something about taking a boat. I don't know. Don't take boats, kids, if you're, if you're military generals. It's just it's asking for trouble. Anyway, Victor Gwain finds an old hag somewhere around where, I don't know, King Arthur would have been. I'm, it's foggy with geography or geology, whatever the hell it is. This hag appeared as an old woman, but gives them the location or something. And our three heroes talk to the Queen of England, who apparently isn't the Queen of England. This is where that talking point comes into play. Apparently, Captain Wesley Pendragon is the King of England and just didn't want to mention it because, I don't know, he's humble? Anyway, she tells us thumbs up. Tells us to go find him. And that's exactly what we do. We're hot on their heels. We are tracking them down. We find a castle sitting next to a lake, a very serene lake. Someone goes up to it, as someone being stone and or pinky. I can't remember. They start to walk on this water. Stone or pinky then follows whichever one went first. And they start to sprint to this castle. Actually a little bit weirded out, but at the same time, finding it very cool that they are able to run across the surface of water. Anushka rolls her eyes and then starts to do the same, I believe. I forget exactly how it played out. They find a castle. Actually, it wasn't hard to find it. They saw it when they arrived. They approach this castle. Stone does a very cool vampire jump up to the, uh, I don't know, catwalk, whatever you want to call it, the, 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 the wall of the castle. He looks in. It's destroyed, more or less. It's old. It's ancient. 
he sees the rug leading up to the throne. And before he can get up to the throne to sit in it, they see a shadow casted over top of the castle. It was Nessie. It was the Loch Ness Monster. It was a dragon. A very large dragon casting a very large shadow over the three of us in this castle. Who then Anushka kills in like two shots with a sniper rifle. Good work balancing that one, buddy. Anyway. Didn't get a single shot off, and it's just frustrating me. I'm sorry. I don't I didn't mean that intentionally. Listen. We take out Nessie. This dragon falls to the ground. I think we try to investigate, and for some reason we really couldn't, because that wasn't the plot that Huddy wanted to talk about. The real plot was happening underneath this castle. We found a spiral staircase that descends down into the cavern, the covered cavern, because that's how caverns work. They typically have a ceiling. We follow this down into an underwater waterfall, a very wide open area. We can look out in one direction, it is open. And the ceiling of some parts of this cavern is actually the water of the lake. It is suspended, still visible, but not falling. Suspended by the power of friendship. We see a stone holding a sword. I had to rework that sentence. A sword stuck in stone down at the bottom. We're about three levels up. There's a second level and then the base level. We see Nazis around we see Pendragon chained to the wall near the sword because that's a good move if you're a bad guy but your biggest arch enemy next to a weapon that gives him ultimate power and strength Sir Victor Gwain is saying some snarky and evil Pendragon as we sneak up we initiate combat we're taking out bad guys Nazis mercenary Nazis whatever you want to call them left and right this is by the way Sir Victor Gwain working for his organization known as the Legion of the Black Dragon. I should have mentioned that a long time ago, but now you know. Legion of the Black Dragon, antithesis of the Knights of Pendragon. We're fighting Gwen. we're fighting the other bad guys, and suddenly the lights go out, the strobes start up, house music pumps in, it's Marshmallow, I'm just kidding. We look up, and Wesley Pendragon is standing with his eyes rolled back in his head, holding a sword, but not... What's the word for... Wanting to do harm. Doesn't matter. He's holding the sword above us. And he comes down. Strikes Gwen once or twice. I think it was like a cutscene. I don't remember. There wasn't a whole lot of combat. But Gwen eats shit. Basically. Gwen is the bad guy. From the Legion of the Black Dragon. Keep that in mind. Anyway. Into the Sis. Knight's Pen Dragon. Who we're fighting for. Anyway. Gwen is dead. Captain Pendragon takes the sword. And goes to some lady in the water. Who appeared. I don't remember that one. Obviously, it's the Lady of the Lake, but I forget how he introduced it. It was some crazy shit. And then, I don't know, he prays or says something to the lady, and then she takes the sword and dis the fucking peers into the lake again. And it's like, hey, why didn't you keep it, man? And he's like, I gotta, I don't know, do what's right or something. It's like, hey, aren't you thinking about, I don't know, winning the game? Captain Pendragon didn't know it was a game because it's an NPC played by the Keeper. Not important. We ascend out of this lake. Captain Pendragon is upset that we killed his pet, uh, Nessie, I guess. I think there was another name. Anyway, yeah, we fucked it up. Nushka fucked it up. Actually, Stone and Pinky take none of the blame. Anyway, we get back. We chat it up. We feast. I don't know. Whatever we do at uh, Pendragon headquarters. We then find ourselves at the Battle of the Bulge. We're helping out other troops. This is Belgium, mind you. At this point, I believe it to be 1943, 1944. Probably 1944, because I believe we've already made it there. Battle of the Bulge, we get into a large tank fight, right? We're in some town, or whatever. And there's tanks coming over bridges. They're coming from down the hill. Doesn't matter, because we're pulp characters. We're taking out tanks left and right. Someone's man in the gun. Uh, Stone's on the machine gun. Anushka's on the turret, I believe. Pinky's driving because we all have our respective abilities. Stone's mowing down soldiers. Nushka's kicking out tanks from a distance. Pinky's piloting just fine. He actually jumps out to fix the tank at one point because he is a mechanical genius. Keep that in mind. We then proceed 
little bit farther out of the town. We come up to a bridge, and we find a king tiger, the largest, one of the largest tanks Germany ever used, if not the largest, sitting at the other side. Before we even get a chance to think, a cutscene plays out. It blows up on the side of our tank, the shell that fired from this king tiger. It launches us to the side. We roll down this hill, this slope through the snow. Our tank is demolished. Our vision is hazy. Our ears are ringing. And we stumble our way through the forest. Long story short, we find a clearing in the forest where Ithaca, or Ithaqua, the Cthulhu mythos deity, great old one, is just waiting in a fucking cave for us. How do you find Ithaca or Ithaqua? I don't know, man. Just shoot it a bunch of times, I guess. Or, if you're stone, lunge at it with, I don't know, special sword fingers. However, we attribute this battle to Pinky and his brilliant idea that actually worked, and it worked very well. Pinky decided to place a bit of a tripwire at the base of the cave that it is. I'm just going to say Ithaqua. Excuse me. Ithaqua pops out of. He lines it with a tripwire. We lure it back towards the beginning. Stone lands a solid heel kick into the back of this being, this great old one. Launches him into the cave, tripping that tripwire and sending out an explosive shock that sends back our heroes, but more importantly, destroys the opening, the mouth, and a little bit of the inside of this cave, closing it up with stone and rock. And depending on how you balance a deity, a great old one for a pulp adventure, with uh, three rather, well, magical human beings in their own right, uh, we then essentially more or less trapped Ithaqua, which is really cool. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Battle of the Bulge. He was there, and we trapped him. And a lot more shit probably could have happened if uh, he decided to wreak havoc on everyone that was around him. Anyway. Episodes 19 and 20. We are now towards the end. These are the last episodes. The last... Uh, this is the last mission that our three heroes have been assigned. I'm going to take a drink. We are now back in Germany. We're in Berlin. Berlin in Germany. I don't know, man. I don't know anymore. I'm not a geologist. Okay, yeah, it's the capital of Germany. That makes sense. I get it confused with France, which is Paris. I don't know. I'm not embarrassed. Anyway, we're in Berlin. We're staging an all-out all out attack. The three heroes push through the eastern front line where the Russians are attacking. Some notice Anushka, but they don't say anything because if they even might know who Anushka is, they ignore her because of all the good that Anushka has done, despite the fact that she might be labeled a deserter. We push into the town. There's snipers dotting windows in some of these buildings on the outskirts. Anushka has a rifle sniper fight with a couple taking them out. Because again, crack shot. We push forward into town. We come across Nazi zombies once more, taking them out after taking out those soldiers. We push even further into town, and we hear, coming down an alley, three die toten, the same beings, the same uh, what appear to be manufactured beings, proceeding towards us, swords for fingers, armored heads, doesn't matter, we know what to do now. We jump on it. Stone, Pinky, and Nushka. We take them out fairly quickly, piercing their armor, with rounds, or possibly splitting the neck from the, from the torso, from the body. Die Toten are down. Nazi zombies are down. The soldiers are down. As we cut through here, we find more soldiers. Actually, this may have been before the zombies. My timeline in my head is all messy. Doesn't matter. We find some soldiers chilling out in these houses. Stone decides he wants a piece. As Anushka and Pinky try to sneak around, doesn't matter. He kicks the door in. Finds some TNT in his pack 
that Pinky left him because Pinky tried to use him as a pack mule. So, why not use TNT when you got it? When in Rome. But we're not in Rome, we're in Berlin. Because now I know, and I'm a geographist. Right, a fister. Sorry. Geographist. <laughs> anyway, I'm a scientist. I'm a, I'm a locational scientist. He takes out some Nazi soldiers on the first floor, places the TNT in the wood beam supporting the second floor. Pinky and Anushka are taking out Nazi soldiers in this other house, covering his backside. Stone then sets off the TNT, blowing up this house, or at least this portion of the second floor, killing some of the soldiers while a couple remain. They take him out, but there's one young soldier. These are all elite soldiers, mind you. Nothing that we had faced yet. These are the ones at the top of the ranks that we did not realize until we started fighting. And shit got pretty close. Not gonna lie to you. We capture one. There's cyanide tooth in the back. Nushka rips it out. Keeps it, I think. Ugh. It didn't even dawn on me until now that, yeah, no, kept it. We interrogate this soldier. What are we interrogating him for? Well, the reason we're here. The reason we're in Berlin. The final mission. To assassinate the Fuhrer. Kill Hitler. Get rid of him. Because... If we can accomplish all that we have accomplished over the vast many locations we have accomplished them in, we can take out the fear. Anyway, his time was coming, and I think he knew it. We eventually get rid of the soldier that we are interrogating, proceed in, then the die happened. happen. And then we find ourselves pinned. We kept pushing in as far as we could into Berlin. And eventually it stopped. We're in a burned out, destroyed church yet again. We are hit from every direction with zombies, die toten, elite soldiers, a tank eventually rolls in. We manage to combat each and every one with the keeper having a little bit more aggression in those NPC moves. Something we had yet to see as it was, well, nearing the finale. We manage to skirt by Pinky using his one last genius idea of luring the tank in, managing to stick explosives onto the fuel tank, and as a last measure, blow up the tank that would have ended all of us, as Stone and Anushka weren't looking good. The tank explodes. Every other being is dead. Anushka grabs Pinky. As a bombardment, a Russian bombardment, now proceeds across the sky. This is following Stone pushing that trident that he has now reacquired up into the sky to be then struck by lightning. Possibly that lightning summoned that bombardment, told them where to go, as if it's a flare. Because it's almost as if the rain came from the trident, or at least he thought. The bombardment starts. Bombs explode all around us. Anushka is pulling Pinky away from this burned out building. He is unconscious and suddenly very much lighter than Anushka remembers. She lays him down to find that everything below his waist has been blown to bits. Pinky no longer has his legs. He mutters out a few last breaths. Anushka, stunned, uncertain of what to do, calls out for Stone, who is much farther away on the other side of where this church used to be, running for his own life, eventually being knocked unconscious, as him and Anushka wake up, strapped to tables, looking into the eyes of the Fuhrer. He makes a few bad guy remarks, as they do, and shoots Anushka in the head. Killing him. Before Stone can process what exactly has happened, he finds the restraints on this table have loosened. He's able to stand up, sit up, witness Nushka's dead body on the table next to him, look up and see a massive, massive stone or throne poking up into the sky, piercing 
red clouds as lightning strikes around. He sees a window to another world open, a portal, and out steps two figures. And if Stone did any of his reading, which he didn't, he might recognize one as a man with a sword, a bit of a cape, possibly, maybe a crown. This is a king, specifically a King Arthur, who very well might be played by our very own Trevor Turner, as Pinky has unfortunately met his greatest sacrifice, and Anushka as well, who might be playing Lady of the Lake. But that is for you to find out in the next episode tomorrow night, if you are watching right now with this stream. If you are able to catch this recording, and before then, or possibly you're watching it before watching the recording of that final episode, episode 21 of Octum Cthulhu, The Spot Hidden. Well, I certainly tried my best. Uh, <laughs> some of this information, of course, might have been exaggerated or very quickly summarized. These episodes go on for at least, typically, two and a half hours, uh, if they're not cut short. So we definitely summarized quite a bit. But I appreciate you tuning into this. I appreciate you sticking with me, uh, possibly fast forwarding through some to catch up on bits that you might have missed, maybe episodes you didn't see that you did. You just want to fill in uh, the missions in between. Whatever the case might be, we appreciate you tuning in. I really hope you're able to catch episode 21 of Octung. I believe that is all I have for you. I am happy to stall until anyone in chat might want to ask a question about any details I might have missed or anything you might be wondering about. Until then, we have episode 21. Next Tuesday, we will see a returning episode of uh, Cthulhu Dark Ages, as we just finished one last night before this. Other than that, that's all I got for you. Octoon Cthulhu, Knights of Pendragon, World War II, zombies, bad guys, killing Nazis. Fun stuff. All right. This is it for me. Thank you for tuning in. I'm going to end it here. Thank you all for watching. And, well, stay spoopy. <laughs>